From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today from Iowa State University, Lee Schultz will provide this week's analysis of the cattle markets. Also, K-State's Jeff Whitworth with his latest advice on managing insect infestations in field crops and the need to treat or lack thereof in each case. Later then, K-State's Justin Wagner on a special K-State webinar taking place this Thursday featuring several K-State specialists on cattle nutritional management strategies amidst the issues created by the coronavirus situation. And Jeff Wickman has this week's 4-H segment where he talks with K-State's Shane Potter about the virtual 4-H Discovery Days. All that here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good to have you along for this Monday edition of Agriculture Today. Into the cattle market scene we go now with Lee Schultz. Lee is a livestock economist, Iowa State University. Well, Lee, let's accentuate the positive for a moment here. As we look at the trade from this past week, cash and futures bounced back rather nicely and certainly in comparison to what we've seen in recent weeks. It was certainly great to see a, a limit move and, and an expanded limit move on Wednesday and Thursday to really provide some momentum uh, as we kind of settled in on Friday a bit higher. Uh, really, I mean, you look at that June contract as we've transitioned from that April to June contract, it's the highest since March 26th. And then we, we took a dip from then on till, till now as, as we've rallied. Uh, and then before that, March 13th. So giving you a little bit of perspective, you know, it's been about a month since we've seen these prices currently um, that we're seeing in the market. You know, the question, why did, do, have we seen this rally? You know, I think you really have to point to uh, one is the cash prices that, that we've seen that this last week, cash prices were anywhere from three to $10 higher. Uh, obviously the Strong surge in box beef prices have helped support futures and cash prices. What is hope here is, is we've started to get some demand pull back in this market, as well as uh, maybe a bit of, of momentum too uh, on understanding what the, at least what that backlog of cattle is. And as we maybe ramp up some more slaughter, that we can start to work through those, those large inventories um, and all of that. Certainty in a, in a very uncertain time, I think, has spurred these markets a little bit this week. And that leads to an obvious question. One wonders if last week's enthusiasm in the markets, to put it that way, is sustainable or a one-time blip in the trade. Sure. And I think a lot of that, at least when we look at the June contracts, fate uh, may come down to box beef prices. You know, how fast th this strong rally does break and, and if that does alter some of that procurement behavior, that has certainly been driving by those strong levels. Uh, I think really when, when you look at basis levels, they're historically strong, at least really in the, in the last recent decades which really supports the idea that, you know, there's strong demand out there for cattle. And really, it, it's this bottleneck that's been severely impacting prices. And again, if we, if we start to see some improvement there, slaughter, at least when we compare to last week, from the estimates of USDA, we're, we're up 27,000 head compared to last week. Obviously, we're, we're still much below year-ago levels, over 200,000 head below year-ago levels. But if we kind of hit that base, maybe, um, and are working up from here, that obviously all provides momentum in this market. Demand is already there pulling it, very strong demand out there. Um, I think it's just getting this supply situation resolved will provide a lot of momentum in the market. Have to ask you, because of course you're staying attuned to what's going on very, very closely, beef packing plants and pork as well, 
reopening to some degree, but the question remains at what line speeds, at what level of progress will we see beef and other meats flowing into the market again? Have you any sense of that at this time, Lee? That's the the million dollar question when we talk about the the number of cattle out there and number of hogs that had obviously been backed up. You know, rough estimates are we've already backed up about one week slaughter in cattle, maybe even a little bit more and similarly for hogs. So to give you an idea, we need to work through that one week of slaughter while we're still doing the the routine slaughter of, of these market ready animals. Now, I think that question really comes down to the labor base um, and how quickly we can get the labor base back at these packing plants to be operating anywhere near what capacity. And it's important we came into this situation running pretty much at capacity in hogs and, and cattle, especially in March when we really ramped up slaughter um, at, at the end of March there. So the biggest concern, I think, is how do we get some of the absenteeism that's been going on and get that situation resolved? Now, we already know with a lot of changes at these packing plants with distancing measures at best possible being put in and all the safety measures being put in, that that's going to slow down those chain speed. But I think we've also, on the other hand, uh, seen some changes to simplify fabrication. So taking less items down to subprimals, keeping less byproducts are awful in order to really maximize that chain speed. So the net of that is very much unknown because th- these are all new changes at those packing plants. But hopefully all this is really short term in the fact that can we get these packing plants up to 85, 90, 95 percent to work through that backlog as well as work through the inventories that continue to come. What effect is all of this having on our beef export sales? You have the latest weekly data from the USDA on that uh, export traffic. I think we're starting to see maybe a hint that uh, the current situation, as I think we would expect it, may slow down exports here. And again, hopefully this is very short-lived as we're dealing with, with this supply situation. Accumulated exports through April, so if we look January through April, they're up 18%. That, that's good news. Now, the, the, the little bit hesitation is when we look at the outstanding sales. So these are the products that, that have been sold, but they haven't been delivered yet. And we could see some cancellation of those sales. Those are down 18% compared to year ago levels. That suggests that the prices we're seeing those wholesale prices, the limited availability that our own consumers are facing, that's potentially showing up on the export market. So we could see a short blip here where we've seen a record pace in exports take a little bit of a slowdown over the next couple of months, uh, similar to what we've seen here uh, domestically. Um, but I think it's still important to highlight that the value of those exports doesn't go away. Um, and though they remain very strong. The awful and byproducts that don't really have much value here have a tremendous value on, on that export market. And products that we don't consume here in general have a lot of value on, on the export market. So I think that does remain a, a big concern here short term. Uh, and then even longer term, does that lead to longer term ramifications as we get into the next several months and we're in that recovery process? Well, let's spend a moment on what appears to be a favorable turn of events, and that is the grazing prospects for this summer. Uh, There is drought here and there, but for the most part, it sounds, Lee, like the opportunity to put some pounds on, economically speaking, with uh, the grass conditions that be, might be, in fact, to the good of the producer. Well, the whole cost of production situation has improved. It's been to the detriment of grain prices uh, because of the the COVID-19 situation and the uncertainty and and what that's caused in in the grain complex. But forage uh, specifically, we're really entering a, a key period now. USDA starts measuring in their crop progress report the range and pasture conditions. They were released for the first time here in 2020 for the week ending May 3rd. And those range of pasture conditions, while it's still early, are suggesting pretty good condition. Nationally, if we look at good to excellent conditions, roughly about 50% of the range and pasture in the United States is in that condition. So at least to start this grazing season, 
we're in a pretty good situation. I think another positive thing when we look at forage situation is back in the prospective planning report in March, when uh, USDA surveyed producers, and now that's back in March, things obviously can change, but producers suggested they were going to grow about 800 to 900,000 more acres of hay this year. So we're looking at a little bit more available hay acres. Now we don't know what the growing season is. We'll get those updated projections in June about what the actual acreage is. But that suggests we could see a little bit more production of, of hay this year. That also could be because as we looked across the, the grain complex, uh, those margins were pretty thin. So I think you're seeing producers maybe diversify a little bit of their acreage. We're seeing a little bit more go into hay, uh, but that's obviously helpful to the cattle producer to maintain those lower costs potentially and have th- that forage available. All right. And do want to lastly here circle back around to something that you referred to earlier about the strong basis in these markets right now and how a producer could capitalize on that. You would encourage producers to, if they haven't already, review where things are at and and seek out those opportunities. Certainly. And and I know producers are are facing a difficult situation as far as sometimes receiving bids or or getting the the prices that they're wanting. But when we're looking at at the cash market, that's at times been five to even $16, $17 over the board. That's a strong incentive to market those cattle. Um, And also, as as we've seen that producers that maybe hedge these sales back many months ago before the whole COVID-19 situation broke, that's given them a much better net hedge price now because of that very strong basis move. And so uh, we hope this continues, that that the cash prices continue to pull up futures prices. That's going to pull up futures prices across the board um, and provide a lot more optimism in the markets, not only for now, but I think as we look in the marketing decisions this summer and then as we get uh, important marketing windows for the cow-calf producers this fall. Lee, we appreciate your input on all of this. Thanks, and we'll talk again in a few weeks. Thank you. He's a livestock economist at Iowa State University and part of our regular rotation on the cattle markets. That's Lee Schultz on this opening part of Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Next up on This Agriculture Today, a quick roundup of insects active in our field crops in Kansas, courtesy of Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. As we go along here, we'll talk about a potential resurgence of alfalfa weevils at first cutting. And we'll talk about early signs of insects feeding in soybeans. But before we do that, you wanted to address something that's possibly going on out there, Jeff. Producers adding insecticides to their fungicide treatments for their wheat stands. Yes, and thank you very much for having me on today. It is the time of year when a lot of aerial application apparently has been going on wheat for applying fungicides, at least that's what I hear, and I was out and about uh, as weather permitted uh, by myself, making sure I was doing proper social distancing, um, looking at wheat fields, looking for aphids, because I keep hearing from various individuals that the applicators are adding insecticide to the fungicide because that saves uh, application costs. And I understand that. They've done that. We've done this for years. So sampling wheat in south-central and north-central Kansas, very few aphids, and that's generally what we look for is, you know, the bird chariot aphid or green bugs or English grain aphids, very few. You can find them here and there as you can find aphids in about any crop at any time, but nothing even close to approaching treatment levels and I did not see any signs or symptoms of any kind of what I would consider to be a 
aphid vector disease like barley yellow dwarf or wheat street mosaic, which is can be vectored by the mites. And I, that's actually what I was looking for. So I really would like the folks not to add insecticide to the fungicide unless they really need it, because what we're doing, there's quite a few lady beetles and other uh, natural enemies out and about. And when you add that insecticide, that's going to decimate those beneficial insects also that are out there right now for no apparent reason. I mean, if if you have aphids and they do reach the treatment threshold, uh, which is actually 50 or more per stem, then it might be uh, acceptable to save that cost and put an insecticide on the fungicide, but make sure that it's justified. At least that's my opinion, because we're doing away with the beneficials for no reason. And I really hate to see that happen every year. I know it happens every year, and I understand why. But we'd just like to caution folks, uh, if you don't need an insecticide, please don't use it. Duly noted then for wheat producers to consider. Now to alfalfa. There has been some first cutting activity already in the state. Weevils, have they run their first cycle through now, and are they to be much of a problem at this point, Jeff? Well, alfalfa is really taking it uh, this year with all the freeze conditions we had early on in the middle part of April and all of the alfalfa weevil larvae that we had. And a lot of fields were sprayed. A lot of alfalfa weevil larvae will have been decimated because of the freeze, because of spraying, and now because they're simply running their course. They're all just about the larval stage. They're just about done, and they're either pupae or adults. There has been a lot of swathing going on in Kansas, and there's a lot of windrows out there. So that brings up a point. The adult alfalfa weevil doesn't feed much, and they normally leave the field after the first cutting or before the first cutting, anytime the temperatures get up into the 80s. But right now, there are quite a few fields that are just being swathed or have been swathed, and even if you had a good insecticide application, even if you had a freeze that killed 95-plus percent of the larvae, as you go through and cut this alfalfa, you're accumulating alfalfa in these windrows. You're also accumulating whatever larvae and adults are left over. So as long as it's cool or shaded by the windrows, these adults can actually, in the larvae, but mostly the adults, they can actually feed on the stems. They do what we call barking, where they just eat the epidermis or the outside of the stem, but it can hold the plant back a little bit up until the temperatures get up into the 80s or the windrows are removed. Those adults can stay out and feed. And looking at the weather, it looks to me like it's going to be maybe cool for the next seven or ten days or so. So I just want everybody to be aware that these adults can be out there. It's not worth treating for them. I get that question, should I treat under these windrows? No, because as soon as they remove the alfalfa and as soon as the temperatures return to the 80s, the adults will leave. They go away and they oversummer. They won't cause any more problems till next October and November when they return to the fields, start mating and laying eggs again. It's a, They're a one generation a year insects, so... The larval stage is done uh, for the most part. It's just the adults maybe hanging around until it cools off and then maybe doing some barking of the stems, which can retard the growth and can cause this yellow-striped appearance of fields where the windrows were. But again, to stress, we are past the point of treatment for alfalfa weevils this season. Yes. Uh, as far as everything I've seen and everything I've heard in the last week or two, the alfalfa weevil, especially the larval stage, is pretty much done. On to soybeans and bean leaf beetles, prominent or potentially so, you say, in stands out there. What's the latest, Jeff? Yes, uh, soybeans are just now, from what I've seen, just now getting started. Some of the earlier planter ones are germinating. And the bean leaf beetle is probably our first pest in soybeans. The adults overwinter in CRP or woodlots or windrows or in alfalfa, especially alfalfa, 
they will actually feed just a little bit in alfalfa late winter, early spring, uh, until they detect the first germinating soybeans. And they are super good at detecting these first germinating soybeans. They, they always impress me. You can have one little soybean plant out in the middle of a section of a field, and it'll be covered up with bean leaf beetles early on if that's the only one available. So the bean leaf beetle, there's two color phases. There's the pinkish red color phase and the tan color phase. For those who don't know, they're about the size of a lady beetle, uh, except they have six black spots in the center of their back and it has a black border around the wings there. Either adult will feed. They cause the characteristic round or oval-looking holes in the leaves, and they'll feed pretty voraciously early on, but just because they're coming from overwintering and they're all coming into these first emerging soybeans, and it's usually only on the border fields because they stop wherever they find the first uh, soybeans. Now, if you've used an insecticide seed treatment, these seed treatments work pretty well for you know, 21 to 28 days, depending upon the rate you used to protect the plants. But even if you didn't, usually the bean leaf beetle is not that interested in feeding during this stage. They feed a little bit to get nourishment. Mainly, they're going to be laying eggs in the soil around the plants. Those eggs will hatch, and those larvae will start feeding on the roots and the root hairs. But the guys first going out looking at their soybeans, especially if they're looking at the border rows, sometimes those plants can look like they're pretty defoliated or pretty chewed up. But you, you need to remember young soybeans, while they're in a vegetative stage, they can, they're pretty resilient at recovering from defoliation. They can take up to like 50% defoliation, and there will not be any resultant problems with yield uh, once those adults quit feeding. So a sudden response with an insecticide doesn't sound necessary here. Well, if some of the border rows are getting are approaching 50% or more and we don't have really good growing conditions yet, you may consider a spot treatment. Um, you know, a lot of times we go number of insects per row foot or number of insects per square foot. But in the case of soybeans, we usually use defoliation, percent defoliation, as the treatment threshold or the trigger. So, And there can be other insects that are contributing to the defoliation, especially later on. You know, you get green clover worms and web worms and lots of other things. Right now, the only thing I've seen are the bean leaf beetles. But still, if you're getting over 50% defoliation and you got quite a few beetles out there feeding, them, especially the border rows, it might justify a, a spot treatment or at least a treatment around the border of the field. As for the rest of the field, though, would that suggest that one can likely get by without treatment? Well, you need to get out and sample because there's exceptions to every rule when we talk entomology and or biology. <laughs> get out and sample the whole field. Like I said, they're not interested in feeding that much or for that long. They just need that initial nourishment coming from the overwintering stage uh, so that they'll have enough energy to lay eggs around the base of these soybean plants. All right. Well, Jeff, thanks for filling us in. We, of course, will be catching up with you regularly during the growing season to find out what is going on on down the line with insect pressure in our summer crops. Always appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. That's Jeff Whitworth. Jeff's a crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, and we'll be back on this Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Information for you cattle producers now on yet another informational opportunity put on by K-State Research and Extension. This will be in webinar form coming up this Thursday, the 14th of May, right at noontime. 
it will get into troubleshooting uncertain times in the beef industry. Now, to lend more detail as to what this will be about, Justin Wagner, beef system specialist with K-State Research and Extension, he'll be among the quartet that will be conducting this webinar. Right to it, Justin. What's the aim of this presentation? Well, Eric, there's been what I'm going to call, you know, several maybe unexpected impacts on beef cattle producers just as it relates to this, the COVID-19 issues. And, you know, one of those that I think our industry has been rapidly maybe dealing with and adapting to is we've really seen some challenges in the availability of distillers grains. We also know that really the second aim of this webinar is going to be really maybe targeted towards the stocker and backgrounding grower backgrounding operations, if you will. Uh, you know, they tend to be the shock absorbers within the cattle industry. And and there's, you know, if we look at pen space availability in the feed yards and, and the possibility of maybe needing to hold some of those cattle or before we would ship them to the yards, you know, we've got to address some of the nutrition challenges associated with that. And, and so that's really our second objective is uh, to take a look at some of those issues, you know, how we might manage those cattle, what are some different feeding strategies that, that we can utilize as well. And there are options there to point out. You and colleagues, including Dale Blassie of K-State, Jamie Lynn Farney, you've been kicking around some ideas, you say. Yeah, we, we certainly have. Uh, if we look at, you know, specifically the distillers issues, we've been having lots of conversations uh, within our group as well as with cattle producers around the state running what I'm going to call alternative protein sources. Maybe a better term would be more traditional protein sources uh, is what I tend to think of. You know, we've been very heavily reliant on distillers products uh, here in the state of Kansas, dry distillers and wet distillers grains, you know, really for a number of years. And as we look at that, you know, prior to the advent of the ethanol industry in Kansas and in the dawn of kind of that era, uh, you know, we looked at alfalfa, soybean meal. We're, we're having lots of conversations about those kind of things. Um, even urea, which is something that, you know, many producers probably haven't used in a supplement. Uh, some have still used it, but it's been far less common, I would say, in, in maybe more, more recently uh, than what it would have been, you know, let's say a decade ago as we look at that. And so, you know, we're going to talk about some of those regional differences uh, with uh, Dr. Farney and myself kind of approaching it from the two ends of the state. Um, there's different products that might be available and give producers some guidelines, uh, not only in that stalker segment or stalker background or segment, I guess, if you will, but also maybe as we look forward into the fall and looking at protein supplementation on the cow herds, right now we don't, we really don't know what, you know, that future is a, a really big, a, a bit of an unknown right now at this point. And to that point, this shortage in distillers grains, well, this may extend for quite a while. So as you mentioned, the fall cow supplementation program, what you'll present at this webinar will have legs, so to say. It will be pertinent for quite some time, it would appear. Well, it's, you know, right now, Eric, at this point, it's really hard to say. Um, What we do want to do is just kind of put it on folks, get it on their list. It's something to be thinking about as we move to the fall. It'll be interesting to really kind of see how this situation plays out and if we see those those plants come back online and, and what that looks like in the fall. But we really, you know, August is not that far away. That's the that's the reality of, of things right now as we look at, at maybe planning for. And you'll be taking a look at these alternative protein sources from the nutritional vantage point, but from the affordability vantage point as well. Glenn Tonzer of K-State will be on board in this webinar. Yeah, um, Dr. Tonzer is going to kind of give us a really summarize the current market situation, what those things look like. I don't think you could have that conversation today without at least including a little bit about what those thoughts are. You know, that situation is is ever evolving right now. I think it changes on a daily basis, certainly weekly, and will likely change in the in the near future as well. So to participation here, this is a free webinar, and it will be, to point out, interactive question and answer opportunities will be there? Yeah, that's right, Eric. We're going to have uh, each one of the presenters is, is going to do a short presentation, and we're, we'll, hopefully we'll have a, a little bit of time to to address any questions from the group online at, at the end there from each one of the presenters. Our anticipation is we're going to start right at noon. Uh, we'd like to have it wrapped up 
we don't really have an end time, but uh, we'd certainly, we're, our thoughts are to keep it around an hour, just kind of over that lunch hour and, and address any of the questions that producers might have as well and just give them a time to interact with us on a, in a larger setting. And producers, other interested parties, this is a wide open opportunity. It, it is. It is wide open at the, at this point. Yes, sir. So how do folks link into this webinar? And uh, you do want pre-registrations here, if at all possible. Yes. Yeah, so pre-registration is, is required. And so the easiest way to do that, to get yourself registered, if this is something you'd like to participate in, would be to, our, to go to our main website with the KSU Beef Team. That address is ksubeef.org. So... So pretty simple. This webinar, you'll see a registration link, troubleshooting uncertain times in the beef industry. If you click there, there'll be a few basic questions, um, likely an email address that, that will then submit that invitation to. So relatively simple to get registered, and we certainly look forward to seeing a few folks online. Excellent. So listeners, if you're interested in taking this in, secure your spot for this webinar. It is entitled Troubleshooting Uncertain Times in the Beef Industry, being put on by K-State Research and Extension. Go to ksubeef.org right away and get your name on the list to be part of that webinar featuring several individuals from K-State, Dale Blassie, Glenn Tonzer, Jamie Lynn Farney, and Justin. We appreciate the work. Justin, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. That from Justin Wagner, Beef System Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, ksubeef.org, with all of the details on this forthcoming webinar this coming Thursday, May the 14th, from noon to roughly 1 o'clock, cattle producers. And while we're talking webinars, bringing to your attention as well, the next in the series of online gatherings, as they're calling them, being put on by the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, on the economic implications of the COVID-19 situation for agriculture. That next session is, in fact, this coming Thursday as well, in the evening, 7 o'clock. Featured there will be K-State grain market economist Dan O'Brien. You can sign up for that webinar at agmanager.info, agmanager.info, this Thursday evening, 7 o'clock. Dan O'Brien, COVID and the grain markets. We'll be back with more on Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Discovery Days offers Kansas youth classes and tours about 4-H projects, careers, hobbies, community services, and more. However, because of the restrictions regarding face-to-face contact, this year it will be similar but different. Kansas 4-H Volunteer Development Specialist Shane Potter says Discovery Days won't be held on the Kansas State University campus. It'll be taking place virtually. Exactly. So as we're looking for ways that we can still engage and work with our youth We want to provide that good content and that ability to connect with youth from across the state. We realize that this will not replace the in-person pieces and the friendships and connections that are made during Discovery Days, but we can still do some great things. And so we are going to move forward and offer some great virtual learning and engagement around that same time frame that we're going to originally do Discovery Days. We are going to have the event on May 27th through the 29th, and we're going to offer some live events during that time frame. So on the morning of the 27th, 28th, and 29th, we will have keynote speakers. We will have sessions where youth can sign in and engage with content experts from campus and and, and around that can guide them in their project learning and and learn about those careers and that connection to education that, you know, they would have done in in an in-person session. We also realize that it is not always easy for youth to connect at one time. So all of our sessions will be recorded. So if youth or volunteers want to engage later and watch the session, they could do that. We've also had lots of presenters from campus and around that are willing to do recorded sessions. So even though we are sad that we won't be able to meet in person, we're creating a, a whole wealth of knowledge and resources that hopefully can be used in the future as well. All of our speakers really still tie to educational units. We're looking at exploring what are their options for college and after high school 
and how they can prepare now to help them be successful in those ventures. This is also a great opportunity for them to give back. So one of the things that we're planning is some service learning. So how can youth that are taking part in 4-H really give back to their community? And we're looking at having youth create some digital media, some pieces that are explaining what they've learned and how they can give their connection back to the community. So it might be something around their projects and how they could teach others about, you know, ag literacy or the things they've learned in their science projects where they are engaging and, and really making a difference in their community. I know this was set before all of this happened in terms of the pandemic, but it was 2020 a vision for the future, and you are certainly implementing that from the get-go. Yeah, we're trying. And yes, that that was something. We have a a youth group that helps provide input for what we should be doing, and that was their plan long ago, a vision for the future. And we're still moving towards that, because irregardless of, you know, what's happening, we're building resilience for our 4-Hers. And this is a good example of that, how youth voice is still guiding what we're doing and how we can really move forward to provide things even in difficult times. This is still open to youth 13 to 18? It is. So, you know, we made a few changes. We are going to have the event open to to all youth. The target is still that older youth, 13 to 18, as far as the content. But really, this is something that we want to be a resource for all youth across the state. So as they go through, we will ask them to do a pre-registration for the live events, just so our speakers have a, an idea of how many youth they're going to work with. But otherwise, this is something we want to be a resource for the youth across camp. And as we do that, we've, we've looked at ways that can really help them engage. For example, we'll have them work with some of our 4-H council members to do some small group interactions in, the, in, in one of the afternoons. So they're still gaining some of those connections and really learning about people from across the state. So even though they can't be physically in the same room, they'll be able to see each other on the video screen? Absolutely. Technology is great, and we really want to use it to the best of our ability. So being able to break out in small groups, ask questions, engage with one another, and even though it it can be a, a difficult component, it's really providing that growth. So as we're looking at career and college readiness, you know, these are skills that hopefully can go on and help them in the future. By being able to engage in an online platform, they're more prepared to maybe do a video interview someday. We're providing them a safe opportunity to practice skills that will help them in the future. Were you, for the most part, able to offer the same things that you would have done had they been on campus? Yeah, it's it's been a challenge with some of our pieces because, you know, we we really strive for hands-on learning where youth are immersed in content, and many of those things will be similar. Again, we know it won't be the exact same experience. We're not trying to replace an in-person piece, but this is what we see as a kind of a supplement. And it really, if it works, hopefully this will help us be better in the future. So if we can have the larger in-person events like this, incorporating some technology or deepened learning as they take part in person. And then, you know, we talk about blended learning where they're doing some pieces online. And this is helping us look into those options. Our goal is to not replace again, but make some components that are still a connection. For example, one online platform, youth often like having a t-shirt or piece to remember the event. We talk about belonging. So our our youth advisory group for the program decided we should really still do a t-shirt for the program. So we're going to have an option where youth can order shirts and things from Discovery Days on demand as kind of a remembrance. And that's one of those pieces that we still, we know it's not the same, but we want to capture some of those good things that build memories and connections into the future. And another change will be the fact that there is not going to be a registration fee, but you do still want people to get registered. We do. And so as we've been looking at best practices, we want to provide a safe environment for all the youth that are taking part. So we will ask people to register for the the live sessions. And Discovery Days, again, the live piece that we're looking at hosting is May 27th, 28th, and 29th. We'll ask people, if possible, to register at least that week before, so May 22nd, once people are registered, we'll send out the information directly to them to connect in the live version. And that registration will give them a password for getting into the sessions. Exactly, yep. Similar to registration to what they would have had in the past. They'll have options for workshops. We'll have some keynote addresses. And and this one, though, instead of um, doing an all or none, they can pick the things that are most interesting to them. So if you wanted to do, you know, a couple sessions on the first day and then you weren't available and you wanted to do a couple sessions on the last day, that would be totally fine. Again, we're looking at that is the value of technology is that we're providing a more flexible experience. So we still 
want to help youth engage, you want to help them learn, but we're really trying to tailor the experience to the learner so it best fits their needs. And how can they find all of the registration information? So the easiest way to find information is to just go to the main Kansas 4-H page, and that's kansas4h.org. And when you go to that page, you'll find a link to click and register for Discovery Day. That's Kansas 4-H Volunteer Development Specialist Shane Potter. Again, to register for virtual Discovery Days being held May 27 through the 29th, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.